in the future, Dan, we could do this uh, as a live feed to your YouTube channel. Yeah, I was reading about that earlier on. Yeah, sounds good. So we have some people starting to show up. We are now live. In fact, quite a few have jumped in real quick. That's good. So Dan, you want to do the pole dance now, whatever it is that you do, or the, the hairstyling lesson? Is that how we're starting? We can start. We can definitely start with your beard, John, but we've uh, <laughs> a few more guys to jump well, on. This is, you're the before, I'm the after. This is the young version, <laughs> this is the old version. Yeah, so a lot of you will know John for his famous photo with his slick back hair, and you've never seen him with a beard. Well, he's, he's definitely... Uh, got Dan Trevini inspired and decided to, to spawn the beard. It's looking really good, John. We're getting there. We're getting there. My, my yeah. wife is not happy, but, you know, it was sort of her idea by accident. She says, I hadn't shaved for two or three days. And she says, what do you think you're going to beard during this virus? I thought, oh, okay. I'm and sure the way she said it, she, w I'm she sure wasn't if objective. In Silicon Valley, you, um, you'd fit right in there, John, with the rest of the techies. <laughs> Okay, now so we're going to switch classes. Okay, so uh, yeah, we're joined by, I think we've got about a dozen people on, so we just uh, give it a, bit, a few more minutes. But evening, everyone, I hope you're all okay. We're going to get started shortly. I'm so just uh, mocking Kath is, uh, quite, Kath is quite confident. She's already added a question in the Q&A, which is really more of a comment. I think she's implying that she's growing a beard herself, even as a female, but uh, we won't go there. <laughs> I think more of what she's saying is that she and I haven't met and we can actually finally meet after lockdown, so. Okay. Well, Kath, we, uh, we would all love to see a picture of you in your beard, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, she didn't say beard, but uh, that was just me embellishing. So. Oh, okay. Sorry, Kath. Okay, so questions off. So yeah, we've got a few more people joining. We'll give it a couple of more minutes because um, I think we're expecting um, a few dozen. So we'll just give it a few more minutes, guys, if you're all okay to hang on. But welcome everyone. Lovely to a see you. A bit of all. housekeeping. Um, no use of chat. That should be blocked. Use the Q&A. That way it's easier for us to keep track of your questions. A few of you have already figured that out, which is great. Isaac's in uh, He's actually in Frankfurt, Germany. I've spent some time working in Frankfurt. So hello to our German friends. Uh, and Kath, I know, is not in Germany. So we have at least two countries covered. Shall play around a little entertainment. So show people some photos. So this is the view from my balcony right about now when the sun at the right angle does glare off the shard. So I took that photo a couple of weeks ago, but I was noticing about five minutes ago that it looks about the same with the glare. If you look at the building that's sort of tall right next to it, that's actually Guy's Hospital. Little trivia point, folks. That is the tallest hospital in the world. Most of the time they build them horizontally. Uh, we have the version of the shard with the actual NHS blue. Uh, that's an evening shot, same angle, obviously. We could... Uh, Pretend we're at the beach, little sort of wave action going on, a little relaxed, hippies with long hair and beards. Sit around the barbecue at my property in Maui if we wanted to hang out in Maui uh, in Hawaii. Or we can do a tech conversation about how to do things with Zoom. So that'll be my little song and dance for now when it comes to virtual backgrounds and real backgrounds. I won't give my two pennies on that, John, because I actually did a Zoom call on Friday and I was messing around and had a few beers with some of the backgrounds. I ended up uploading a picture of myself with the top off, so I won't, I won't get into that right now. I did it by accident and I couldn't get it off, so your yours are far more respectful. Yeah. I'm the professional. It yeah. goes with the age. Hey, I'm going to put on my still image and step away from it. I got to go get some water. I'll start coughing a little later. And we wouldn't want me to present while I'm trying to make it, trying to cough. No, no worries, John. So it's, it's about six minutes past. I think we'll give it another three or four minutes, give um, some of the, the late guys just to jump on. And then we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. Just for everyone who is logged on at the moment, 
So how it's going to work is uh, I'm going to do a little bit of an intro and a little bit of a um, view or my take on the current set of circumstances, the effect on the property market, where the opportunities are. And then John's going to jump straight in and give his, uh, his two pennies worth. And then we've got a really good interactive session with John using some of the mod cons and the technology side. I, I experienced it for the first time last week, last Wednesday. So keep your phones out, keep listening because you have to log on to a website and you answer the questions on your phone and then it shows up on this on this event or on this Zoom platform. So we uh, we should be ready to start taking the Q&A session, I would have thought around 7 p.m. If you've got any questions in between myself and hand, handing over to John or my presentation, feel free just to put them on the chat and we'll try and answer them as we go. So John's back, still got his beard. I am, I'm here. Cool. We'll give it a couple of more minutes and we'll get started. While we're waiting, I'm not sure that it's the best idea, but let's, let's get some questions going. So what is it that you want to know tonight? Is there anything in particular that if we could cover that one thing it would make it worthwhile for you showing up? Or is there something you want us to avoid? Stuff that you've heard six times already in other Zoom meetings today, and you really don't want to go through it again. So just in the Q&A, post either things you want to know about or things you hope we avoid. By the way, in the Q&A, you can actually uh, upvote or uprate other people's questions, comments, if, uh, if it makes sense. You don't have to, but you can definitely do that. So we know Isaac's from Germany. Have we got anyone further afield online with us? No, I'll take that as a no then. Is there anyone here uh, tonight using Zoom for the first time? I would expect that answer will be no, but if there is anyone using Zoom for the first time, that's fine. I can uh, help you out if you have any questions. Ooh, we have someone from Hong Kong. Excellent. Victoria, I'm more than happy to avoid government grant programs tonight. This is perfectly something not to talk about as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that's a great point, actually, Victoria. So we're not going to really touch on anything that the government have brought in to help um, business owners, individuals, employees, any of that. We're not going to spend too much time about the effects of the lockdowns. I think we're all pretty aware of what's going on and what's happened and the restrictions that, that everyone is facing. We are really going to talk about my view on um, where we are with it and, and the opportunities. And it's going to be quite brief. It's going to be like 10, 15 minutes because we're expecting quite a few phone calls. So we've got an anonymous attendee from Hong Kong, which is great. Well, it's 10 past JC. Should we get started? Certainly. Cool. I'll just share my screen if I can, John. We are good to go now. I had to, I had it locked down so we don't get any, um, what are they called, Zoom bot? Yeah, well, uh, so hopefully you can all see my NPN front slide property investors group UK. Thumbs up from John, which is good. Okay, just went on a bit slow my end. Cool. Okay, guys, well, huge thank you to everyone who is joining us this evening from all over the world, which is great. 
So John and I did a very similar Zoom event last Wednesday for the Norfolk Property Network, which is a local network which I host. It's a physical event which happens every other month. And we also have an online group. It's a lot smaller than the Property Investors Group. It's, a, it's about 800 strong. Property Investors Group is getting on for 18,500 plus strong. Now, I started the group, I think it's getting on for five years. And the, one of the reasons I started the group was because I was so active in the other groups, but there was so many restrictions. I felt quite pushed down on what I could and couldn't say. And I wanted to create an environment very similar to the Norfolk Property Network, but online where people could come and do what they wanted within reason, as long as it was respectful, but they felt safe to ask the questions and never got shot down and didn't feel that they were gonna expose themselves to then get trolled or bullied and then never ask any questions again. And it's definitely evolved from there. And um, given the recent set of circumstances and the success of the event that John and I did last week, we got chatting and we said, look, why not offer it out to the group? It's quite a big group. There's lots of active members. So we put a poll on there and we had, as it stands, 128 votes to say, yes, people would be interested. So that's one of the reasons why we decided to do it. And um, fingers crossed, if you all enjoy it and we get some good feedback, it's something that we may be able to do again in a couple of weeks time. So what, what have we got in store for this evening? Well, it, like the group and like my events, it is going to be a relaxed and interactive session where people should feel completely comfortable and completely content to ask questions um, either via the Q&A um, chat where you can wait right to the end where we do have a dedicated Q&A session. I'm going to give you a bit of a welcome, which is what I'm doing now, and then I'm going to give you my take on this global crisis. And we're going to focus on where I think the opportunities are and some of the opportunities that I have already stepped into just in the last 48 hours. And then after that 10, 15 minute session, I'm going to hand over to, to John who um, owns property from Hawaii to Bradford. I think that's right, isn't it, John? Thumbs up. That's correct. Great. And uh, uh, John's going to give us some of his input, and we've got a, a really interesting interactive session about raising funds legally. And one of the biggest parts of my journey and one of the biggest reasons for my early success was the ability to raise funds and work with investors. And more so than ever, we're going to be looking towards working with each other because of the restrict restrictions some of the lenders are bringing. So it's, it's important that we do it from the, from the get-go very uh, in the right way and the legal way. And, and not only we all want to avoid anything that could come off of ramifications just by doing the wrong thing. Ignorance is an excuse. So really worthwhile session, very interactive, a lot of fun. So I'm really looking forward to that. Okay, so I've given you a bit of a, an overview of why I started the group. I'll give you a, a two, a, a 30 second, 60 second introduction to who I am. So my name's Dan Trevini. Those are my personal details, my personal email address and mobile number. You can email me, text me, anything, anytime, I'll happily answer it. I don't sell courses, I don't, don't mentor people, I do it because I like to give back and I like to interact with people because that's how I learn. Um, I started off in property, I bought my first property when I was like 21, um, back in the old Northern Rock days and I made every mistake you can think of but fast forward to 2011, 2012, I discovered the student market and in a long story short, I ramped it up and ran out of money and by 2014, I started working with investors and over the period of 2014 today, I bought and sold in the region of around 150 different properties, which are a mixture of student HMOs to commercial, to pubs, to new builds, to, to commercial conversions. Um, one of the things that I stick to, which is my location, I tend not to go more than five miles from where I live. Uh, I have done a little, I have gone a little bit further in the past, but not far, maybe 30, 40 miles. So what have we got installed for this evening? So I'm going to talk to you about what we know. Are we entering a crash? What does this mean for you and I and property investors and developers and where, where the opportunities are? And as um, I think as Victoria said earlier on, 
I'm not going to give you a repeat or a read off of what the government has done. We all know what they are doing, whether we agree with it or not, or whether we see an opportunity or not, that's for, for you uh, to decide outside of this environment. So where are we and what do we know where we are? Well, we know that the lockdown has been brought into effect and that has brought the property market to its knees. However you want to view it, however which way you want to cut it, the property market has in some shape or form been restricted. So whether that's uh, people being able to complete on purchases, whether that's being able to do viewings, evict tenants, show new tenants around, whatever it may be, it's been hugely restricted. And that is because of many reasons, but we have also a restriction within the economy. It isn't just limited to the property market. The same goes for any sector currently within the UK economy. Everyone is in a similar sort of boat. So does that mean that we are entering a crash? Now, I've done a few videos on this, and if you don't already, check out my YouTube channel, uh, Content Rich. I've got some links in the Property Investors Group um, already, so please do click on those. I've done some videos on this, and it's been quite a controversial topic because um, a lot of the comments have been directed at me for saying that we are entering a crash and more recently we are now in the crash and the comments have been quite directed that I'm scaremongering or that we are not at the bottom or the crash is yet to come and I think if we just look back at the 2008 recession now I was definitely um, involved in property but nowhere near the level I am now but I do remember it very very well and one of the key things that stands out for me was that when we were entering into the recession and we were entering into the crash and people were um, queuing up outside of Northern Rock to get their money out because they were frightened they were going to lose it for years to come to 2010 I think it was people employers companies Property people were denying that we were actually in this recession or we were in this crash. And it was only in hindsight when we looked back and we said, yeah, well, you know what, that year we were in a recession, so we can't compare it. And I started to look at the current set of circumstances and I thought, what if we are actually in the crash right now? Because no one really wants to buy because everyone thinks it's going to bottom out more. And uh, people don't really want to sell because they think that the they're going to sell for a, for a low price. So that restriction in itself could cause a crash. So I did a few videos. I did some more market research. I've got some property purchases going on that I've agreed for some time. Some of them I pulled out of. But I started to look at where the opportunities um, have been restricted because so many people were buying. And one of the places was auctions. And I haven't bought an auction up until last year for, for some years before that because properties were selling for more than what they would do on the open market. So when the masses are doing that, you kind of do the opposite. And there was an auction last week, which I had underwrote a couple of properties, but it was one I really wanted to underwrite and they would not accept my offer. And that property didn't sell, so it, it kind of did me a favour. And I ended up buying that property for less than what my underwrite offer was. And if you compare that property to the properties that have sold or are on the market, it's around a 30% below market value. And I thought that was on an online auction, a very popular one local to Norfolk. Now, what makes me different to everyone else? And the reason is, is no one wanted to buy at that moment in time. Lenders are restricted. and nine times out of 10, sellers are not going to sell at a lower price. But when they do need to sell, they will sell. And so I, I found one of those properties that ticked the box and I was prepared to buy it. And with that level of restrictions, I came to the conclusion that we are actually in a crash right now. And no one really agrees with me. I don't think anyway. I'm sure there are a few people who, who don't voice their opinion. So what does that mean for, for all of us as property investors and deal sources and developers and rent to renters. Well, I think if we look at the market from 2008, and hopefully you can all see this slide with uh, the chancellor in the background, hopefully John will give me a thumbs up that you can. Thanks, John. 
And even though this recession and this crash is going to be unlike anything we've ever seen before, and the causes and the effects of it are unlike anything that's come before it, the reality is crashes do happen. And when that crash is happening in history, it's considered the worst crash and nothing's been like it before. But we, time moves on and history, we look back at it. So I thought I'd have a look at what other crashes had happened in the past that had similar levels of drop or decline to what we're expecting. Now, hopefully you can see, if I can get my mouse, yes, great. You can see to the right of the screen here, we've got the coronavirus lockdown bar, which is quite severe. And then if we look just to the left of that, we've got the credit crunch bar. So we're probably two and a half times more expected crash, drop in GDP, whatever you want to call it, than the credit crunch. And if you look back at history, we've got um, some of the ones which are similar in terms of severe. We've got World War I, Spanish flu, Great Frost of 1708, 09 even, whatever that was. Uh, so I think that gives us a good indication of where we are going to be in terms of the crash and the severity of it. And I thought I would then share this slide with you. There's a huge amount of numbers on here. We're not going to go through them all. But if we look to the right of the screen again, move John's lovely picture away. And if we look at the total borrowing expected this year to be 273 billion, and we, and we compare that to the total borrowing of the 2009 deep crash recession of 160 billion, we're around 70% more borrowing, which is a good indication of the level of the severity of what is going to happen and what's going to come. And I've done a couple of videos on this um, and they're here just uh, for you to see some of the thumbnails on my YouTube channel, which uh, the link to the uh, Facebook group. So we understand that there are huge things playing in the market and they are going to be more severe than most people have seen, definitely in my lifetime. John um, is a little bit older than me, so we'll have to get his take on every recession that he's lived through, which is probably most on that chart that I shared with you. Um, no need to comment, John. Hey, 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 hey. <laughs> no, not quite that many. <laughs> um, and this time round, we've we've got a huge, we've got such a fragmented, different market. There's rent to rent, there's deal sources, there's a service accommodation, there's loads of things going on, which I think was far different 2008 crash but we've got things that aren't happening today that were happening in 2008 so it's kind of the same but it's different but we are seeing some of the some of the markets which are um i would say at the entry point where you don't need mass cash levels things like rent to rent things like rent to service accommodation we're seeing that sector massively massively hit within this market and unfortunately, because of the nature of the beast and the segmentation, most, and I say most because I know some renter-renters who are great operators and are not doing this, but unfortunately we are seeing for the nature of the beast of this sector that those properties aren't now generating income. There's not a pot of cash to facilitate um, riding the wave. So those properties are just being handed back. And I've heard some horror stories that people don't care what's in the contract. They're gonna throw them back at the landlord anyway. What's going to happen, the fallout effect of that is landlords and the rent to rent sector is going to be tarnished in some state, shape or form with a negative brush. So those rent to renters who are out there who are on this video, do take note that you've got an opportunity here that if you can ride this wave, it's going to cost you some money, you're all going to lose some money, but what you will gain in terms of reputation and credibility that you are able to hang your hat on for years to come, that you are able to honor your agreement with those landlords, even in this unprecedented, complete crash of circumstances. Deal sources, landlords, developers, I think um, uh, if I speak to developers first of all, you don't wanna be looking to getting into massive leveraged developments when you're hugely reliant on those drawdown facilities from lenders. I have done several development projects or conversion projects where we have been in circumstances where we rely on the funds to be drawn down and banks because it's unregulated territory decide to pull the plug um, for various reasons it can be anything from 
they uh, they see an overspend, they want you to fund that first, or they're restricting their lending because the market has shifted in the area, whatever it may be, they can make a decision, they can turn around and say, look, we don't want the color of your shoelaces, we're gonna start lending. So I, I don't, if you're not, if you're gearing high, high, high loan to values on these developments, you may want to reconsider your numbers and take on such large projects. But for me, I am not looking to take on anything sort of a million pound plus where I need to then borrow the development funds. Having the funds in the bank, if you've got them, great, you can then go forward with them and it doesn't really matter what the banks do. Obviously, landlords and Victoria, your question is burning in the back of my head, so I'm not going to repeat too much, but we all know where we are with, with tenants. And I myself have had a couple of tenants who have said to me, yeah, I'll, I'll have three months free rent, Dan, if that's okay, great stuff. Um, and surprisingly, it's not come from any of my student tenants, which makes up predominantly my, H, my, my portfolio. And you can either hit that direct on, but my take on it and my advice and my experience has been to have a conversation with the tenants and say, look, it's not actually three months rent free, it's a holiday, there's costs involved. If I get it, then it's taxed onto the principal, I have to pay more interest, maybe pass that cost on to you. You have to pay the rent to me anyway, so if you can afford it, pay it now, so you don't have a huge balance um, accruing to pay me at the end of the three months. And I'm, I'm, I'm quite fortunate because I've, I've proactively had those conversations and I've not been in the first instance too badly hurt. And anyone who has been late paying, they're paying me in drips and drabs, I've got a payment plan in place. But there is gonna come a time where people don't pay their rates. And for the next two months, we can't do anything about that in terms of evictions. But I just urge you to keep having the conversation with your tenants and try not to get into a set of circumstances where you're at head of logs because no one's going to win and no one's going to get paid any rent. So even if you have to take a bit of a hit on cash flow, the amount, but you agree to get something, that would be my take on it. Okay, so just round, finishing up now on the opportunities and I appreciate there's going to be a few questions on these. So I'll give a, an overview. And um, if anyone's got any questions, then, then do fire away. I can't see the question box, JC, so you'll have to just read them out to me um, while we finish off this part. So yeah, happy I to do that. Yeah, great, thanks, John. So I talked about one of the opportunities being auctions, and I say one of them, that is one of the biggest. Auction companies have been struggling to get online, so this has kind of forced them into that position. And, in auctions, I've lost so many deals in the room when an emotional buyer steps in and starts putting their hand up way above anything that I wanted to pay. Going online kind of removes that because the emotion of being in the room gets taken away. And um, so you lose that straight away. You also have the people who can't be bothered. They don't want to log on and bid online. And you also have the tech phobia guys who don't know how to switch your computer on. So it starts to remove some of the competitors. But the, the big thing is exchanging and having to complete. And don't get me wrong, I have negotiated a auction type deal to complete within 12 weeks to give me the breathing space, which you can also do. But there is the, the, there is the, the, the point where you exchange and you have to complete. And some people don't necessarily like that amount of pressure when there's other things in play. So, that again removes another set of competitors. So then you've got things like underwriting, which again, I've got a YouTube video on which I explained. So it gives you an advantage over other buyers. Um, it gives you the opportunity to make money without buying a deal. Um, there's all these various things in play, but the reality is at the moment, the right deal in auction and at the right price can put you on the forefront of buying a BMV deal in this market. Now I know what you're thinking, but what if the market drops even further? What if we're not at the bottom yet, Dan? And I hear you loud and, cloud, uh, loud and clear. H however, from my experience in 2008, and I remember it very well, and people started buying as the market was recovering, yes, you, they were paying 10, 15, 20K or percent, a little bit more than where the bottom was. But even if you bought now and it still dropped a little bit further, as long as the deal that you're 
buy-in right now is significantly below where the true market value is or was before this, even if it drops a little bit further, you should be okay. And I'll give you an example. So I bought a property, 117,000. It's, it's, it's worth about 175, 33% below market value. So if the market does crash by 30%, okay, so I've only saved 3%. But if it only crashes by 20%, I've picked up a far stronger deal because of the crisis and not because of where the market is positioned. And that's where a real entrepreneurial property investor should be looking for the opportunities right now. Because the amount of trolling and hate that I've had shares, tells me that most of the property people aren't looking to buy at the moment. Now I stress this, you shouldn't buy yourself into risk. Don't over leverage, use large deposits to get some good, um, use larger deposits to get good products, which are low interest rates, which you can stand the test of time. Should you not be able to rent that property? Should you not be able to give it a lick of paint for materials or builders not being accessible? So I think that's where the, uh, some of the biggest opportunities are in terms of buying. Really quickly, the, some of the biggest sectors I think we should be looking um, to step into are gonna be some of these offices because most companies have been forced into a virtual way of working. I talked to one of my lawyers today and um, he said he's never been busier and he's working from home and his fees that he's generating are more than ever. Um, he's, a, he's a lawyer and he, he deals with um, neighbor dispute, neighborhood disputes and um, uh, husband and wife issues. So maybe that's because of lockdown, I don't know. But um, he's telling me that they're all working virtual, but they're earning a huge amount of money. And I said, well, your officers, you've got three and they're in prime locations in Norwich City Centre. We're talking about millions of pounds of real estate, hundreds of thousands of pounds of overheads to run those properties. If you're a savvy CEO, business owner, you are going to start to question, how much do you need these big places? And not everyone is going to sell. They're going to go back to the way they're working. But some are. And as property investors and developers, we need to start to look at those opportunities. Offices, B1s, permitted developments, below market value offices that can be converted or split up into smaller offices or re retail units to, to rent out to some of the secondary retail markets, which from this fire, uh, the phoenixes will rise, which will be the service-led businesses. And that would be one of my, uh, my, my takes on the opportunities. So I think we had a question just pop up there, but I can't, I'll just stick out and I can see it here. Okay, so Isaac's asked if uh, um, what what are the effects of the of the coronavirus crisis on the UK private rented sector market, current development funding situation in the UK market. So Isaac, um, I, I, I won't go into too much of the detail because we've got Victoria um, Victoria's comment, which is absolutely vital about repeating what the government is already doing. But in a nutshell, so. Um, with the restrictions of not being able to do viewings, um, it's, it's getting increasingly harder to rent properties out that are empty. And tenants who are currently in situ are more than likely affected by the furlough payment or the, the amount of redundancies that are coming or a restriction in um, uh, business if they're self-employed people. I've got uh, cleaners in one of my properties and they specialize in service accommodations. Their work has completely dried up. So the, the market has been affected in a web or in a branch of different ways and tenants are in most or some cases be it, finding it hard to pay their rent. Now the, and the government has publicly announced that they will um, allow or encourage lenders to give payment holidays. And that in turn has led to, I believe, an influx of tenants saying, well, I want to take advantage of that. So I hope that in a roundabout way answers your question without going into huge amounts of detail. And then development funding situation for the UK market. The biggest thing at the moment is what is going to be the GDV of those developments? Are you going to be able to sell them for the prices that you've forecasted? Most developers are working on a 20, 25% of GDV. Now, if we see a reduction in uh, property prices, that margin is going to be 
hugely squeezed um, and funding. So I had a uh, landowner contact me last night via the group and um, their lender and their equity partner have both pulled from the deal. And it's a great deal. It's a great development. But the numbers are big. We're talking like three, three and a half million in terms of total cost. And the GDV is strong, five and a half million, I think it is. So there's still some meat in the, in the deal. We just need to find the right way to position it. But with the majority of lenders putting developers in that set of circumstances, it's making it increasingly difficult. Um, so I hope, Isaac, that answered your question. Uh, Martin, we've got, we've got a question here. I'm finding it difficult to source finance uh, for starting my journey. I've registered my company, but hitting brick walls when it comes to funding. Yeah, so thanks for the question, Martin. And I think, um, like I say, that a lot of people are in similar sets of circumstances because of lenders getting nervous, pulling plugs. And um, I won't name names, but in my experience, the lenders that have already let people down and pull the plugs are the same ones who have let me down in the past. They, and they, they don't seem to change their colours in these, in these sets of circumstances or any. My advice would be to have a discussion with a broker who is completely all to market and there are lenders out there still lending if you do manage to find a lender that is content with your circumstances and your experience and your income and all these various things the other issue we do have is valuations and the great the word on the grape line is that valuations for standard residential single lets are tending to go through on a desktop valuation, but things like large HMOs or buy, refurbish, refinances, if they're hitting people's desks, they're just being put on hold until they can send a valuer in. Now, there are some valuers or some surveying firms out there who are still doing valuations if the property is empty. So there's like three different angles there where if you can get the right lender, in the right set of circumstances with the right property with the right surveyor you can get it through and that's just being resilient and asking the question and keep pushing with your broker if you need help with a broker then i am more than happy to introduce you to my broker who i am working with right now on the deals that i've picked up just um, um i'll tell you what i'll do i'll post a little link in the question here where you can put your your details and i'll pass those those on so Dan, you can post uh, to everybody through the chat. They'll see it if uh, you put it there. Okay. Thank you, John. Um, and for some of the other questions, um, there are a couple that are probably specific to what you're talking about, Dan. And then whether we cover one or two of these at the very end, we'll, we can decide. Okay. And for those that came in uh, after we started, use the Q&A to um, drop in any questions. We can get to them uh, through the Q&A, and that way we know which ones are open, which ones have answered. If we answer your question or we try to and we don't do a good job of it, then definitely add some more or make another comment. That's fine in the Q&A. Yeah, so an Are anonymous we... attendee, which I think is the chat from Hong Kong, has asked, working from home is the next thing. Why would office spaces be in demand? And that is a really great question. And one of, um, to, to answer that directly to the comments that I made, in my view, there are going to be firms, small to medium-sized firms, that give up their premises to go to the more virtual way of working. So I agree with you. In, and the reason why I made that point is because you can take those offices and you can either convert them to a residential or you can split them into smaller units and maybe change the type of market that you're going for. So it may still be offices. If it's ground floor, you may be able to convert it to other commercial types of uses, which tends to be an easier plan and journey than commercial to residential if it's not permitted development. Um, and then there are the co-working spaces, which I had an involvement with a couple of years ago, um, but I understand that they are too suffering um, in the current set of circumstances. But when we go to a more virtual way of working, is the physical meeting space in the city centres or the large cities around the UK 
going to be needed to be more flexible? And is this where more of a flexible office environment where a pay-as-you-go system or a membership system with hot desks and things like that may work better? Now, I am not too experienced in this sector, so I can't give you an experienced view on that. It's just my observation. So I hope that answers your question. Um, okay, I think that was it for the questions so far. So over to you, John. So Dan, take a minute and for any questions you think you answered, close them out. And then if people need to ask something else, they can add a fresh question. Cool. So folks, what I'm gonna do is uh, take a slightly different path than Dan, which is why you're here. You're getting sort of two different perspectives. Uh, I did have a background in Silicon Valley or worked in Silicon Valley, did all those other things that Dan might've said at some point. Um, my boss was Steve Jobs at one point, my direct boss, a friend started LinkedIn. I was a beta tester. I worked at Swiss Bank Corporation in London, which later morphed into UBS. Um, so, you know, finance, technology, started as a property investor. Actually, TechWise started in 82 in Silicon Valley. In 1982, part of my day job was being paid to be online. And then in 1983, I started investing in property. First property was in Silicon Valley in San Jose. So it was the second one. And I more or less have been a property investor the whole time, though I had quite a long career in technology and banking because I rather enjoyed that field. Uh, I wasn't in any rush to leave it. And it's allowed me to build a portfolio over time, which as Dan said, goes from Hawaii to Bradford. And none of the British folks ask about Hawaii. They all say, why would you invest in Bradford? And we can deal with that later if we want, but it's not really why we're here. So I'm gonna take us down a different path now. I'm gonna show you a presentation with a bit of interactivity, as Dan mentioned. I uh, just need to get to the right thing. And oh, by the way, in the chat, I did mention something about a podcast called The Daily. And The Daily is actually a podcast from uh, the New York Times, the actual uh, newspaper. And they have um, a particular episode, which I gave you the title of, and that episode is quite insightful when it comes to the macro idea of the virus, what might happen, the person that they're effectively interviewing has been on two or three others, and you'll hear that he's been very good at seeing into the future. And as he says, I can't predict the future, but I, I do a lot of research, I do a lot of reading, and here's some of the things based on other viruses we've had in the past. His specialty is writing about viruses. And he's actually talking about what will likely happen over the next couple of years. So that might give you a, a better framework to think about your property journey and what the world market might be like when it comes to impacts to people's lives and other things. So jumping to the shared screen, all of you should be able to see it. If you can't see it, put something in the Q&A, but I'm pretty sure you can. Um, tonight is about education. It's about real estate investing together, learning from each other, gaining knowledge about each other, and essentially also uh, maybe forming relationships for future deals. So I'm calling COVID-19 um, triggering a new normal that we have to adjust to the way the world is rather than maybe the way the world was. And we have to uh, adapt. And a very uh, interesting guy, uh, Randy Nelson, he ran the Pixar University. I worked with Randy back at a different company when we were working closely with Steve. And Randy says it's not about error avoidance, it's about error correction. So you can't avoid all errors, but you can respond and adapt. So my comment to you is to focus on what you can control. Cash flow and cash, cash reserves matter probably more than anything else. The idea here is you wanna stay in the game. Don't worry about maximizing your return. In fact, I would say it's a fool's game to focus on ROI. These people that have their spreadsheets and they tell you how great an ROI they're getting. Well, as Warren Buffett would say, when the tide goes out, you can find out who's swimming naked. And the point there is, if you have a fantastic ROI, many times it's because you've got very high leverage or very high debt. And in times like this, that could actually completely wipe you out. In the UK, that might also leave a blemish uh, when it comes to bankruptcy or defaults, and that could be a 10, 12 year uh, long pain uh, to your future. 
So sometimes it's better to have a lower ROI, more cash sitting there, not earning any, any return, but keeping you in the game. It's also a way to build, act, um, build uh, up deals when the cash is in the bank and a hot deal comes along. What you can do right now is you can be building relationships to access capital. There are cash investors, or I'm gonna go through some things later that'll show you what I mean by that, but this is a perfect time to build relationships. For anybody who isn't in London, um, some people say London, all the, that's where all the money is. Well, now you don't have a geographic issue. You don't have to travel for meetings. People will meet with you online. If you're in another country, it might be an opportunity to connect with developers and investors and other people who have boots on the ground here and know the local market. And everybody's sort of open and happy to chat online. It's a wonderful little opportunity to build more relationships. So forget about market timing. Don't even try to time the bottom of the market. There is no real bottom. There's just varying points in time. And most people who say, oh, I called the bottom, they got lucky. Just like a broken clock is gonna be right twice a day, they got lucky. This is not uh, an industry that rewards market timing. It's very difficult to get in and out of real estate transactions. So it's very difficult to say, oh, the market's the bottom, it's today, it's this week, it's this month, let's do a deal. Well, it doesn't work that way. What you can also do is working um, through education, upskilling, improving your knowledge, whether it's how to use your tools, whether it's how to understand financial calculations, whether it's how to build your database of investors, whatever it is, Maybe it's a particular strategy you could learn about. It's a great opportunity right now. So those are sort of my top points. Tonight, right now, you will get very little if you just listen to a lecture. 5% retention rate is what the diagram says. If I can get you interacting, if I can get you sort of participating or sort of somehow engaging, retention will skyrocket compared to just sitting there passively. The only thing better is actually if you're teaching, so maybe in the future you can do that. What I need you to do right now is to go to that site, menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. Use a phone, use your computer, use your tablet. I don't care how you get there, it doesn't matter. And put in the code 330533. So it's on the screen. That number will show up in a few slides. It, it'll be there for a while. You need to just trust me on this one and jump in. So what the first thing you need to do when you get there is enter your first name. No funny, quirky names. Don't try to use anything rude. We're all professionals here, so be nice. Just your first name. So you go to the menti.com, enter the code, put your first name and watch the screen and see what happens. So five of you have already responded. Literally, these are the names. If there was more than one Ash at the session here, then that name would get bigger. So size is an indication of how many people are sharing a name. We might have more than one Mohammed. We could have more than one John. The common names might show up and they'll just be bigger. Uh, but otherwise, this is just a way to break the ice a little and show you a little whiz bang interactive stuff. But we'll get to some really serious questions later and you'll see how this plays out. So I'm gonna slow down ever so slightly so a few others can enter. There's 14 of you that already put the information in. The lower right corner tells you how many other people have actually contributed info. While we're waiting uh, there, John, we have a question from Kath. If cash is in the bank and inflation hits, this could be a risk too, couldn't it? Question mark. Absolutely not. So inflation classically, so I'm old enough that when I was Growing up, inflation was 7 10%, maybe higher than that. Maybe Bank of England rate got to 15%. Um, we're in a 2 to 3 2 to 5% a range. If you have cash in the bank and if inflation erodes it by 2%, 5%, you can handle that. If you get a deal at 20% off because you have the cash to close the deal, okay, so you only got 17% off because 3% was lost in inflation you're way ahead. The cash is the magic bullet that you need when a good deal comes along. Don't worry about the inflation while you're sitting on cash. That's an opportunity cost that you're paying for essentially this inflation issue. And it, it really is quite minor if you're actually looking for deals. So let me move on. There's 15 responses. That's a good number given the number of people on tonight. 
So what is your experience as a real estate investor? Pick one of the following four strategy, four answers. So you're just starting, you've been in a few years, six to 10 years, or you have 11 or more years. And this will tell us a little about the audience tonight, segmented a little when it comes to the relative experience on the session. Uh, there'll be opportunities almost to engage with each other in a sense, but this gives you a sense of the, what's in the room, so to speak. So 14 have already responded. That's just about the right number. And we are looking at, so 86% have five years or less. Um, there's 7%, six to 10 and 11 years or more. That's approximately one or two people. I think it's one each actually. Uh, so just so you have a sense of the mix of who's listening. Now with the same sort of color segmentation for experience, tell me what your main strategy is. The primary strategy that you're using when it comes to property investing, if you are investing, or if you're brand new and just starting, what you're looking for. So is it HMOs, is it development, is it buy to let? For those that are maybe outside of the country, buy to let, it's a simple rental, UK phrase for it, US would say rental. So most people are buy to let, 42% with 12 voters. A uh, couple HMOs, a couple development, or three, actually four now. So interesting that we have three people who are just starting that are focused on development. It's a bit of a difficult end of the business to start in. Uh, a, a tip to you, I'm not saying you can't do it, but a tip to you is you probably want to partner with someone that has experience, uh, at least for your first few deals. Lenders definitely look to experience when they make decisions on financing for development. So let's move on. If you have any questions, you can use the Q&A, that's fine. You could put them in here, that's fine. It doesn't bother me which one you wanna use, but I'm giving you an opportunity. Uh, you can only put questions in, in this presentation when I'm on the question slide, but whatever. So attracting deals or money, attracting suppliers or tenants, that there's different ways to do this. Now I want to sort of highlight something to you. So again, a question, this time, Facebook advertising. How many people here have actually used Facebook advertising? You might've dabbled, you're a regular ongoing user, you run campaigns for someone else, it's essentially a service you provide. So this is approximately the normal distribution that I get when I put up this question. Um, you know, we've got 12 people, it's almost everybody. And we have one person who's a regular ongoing user and everybody else has either not even tried it or they've dabbled. So the dabblers and the not even tried it, we're, that's over 80%. In fact, it's over 90%. And this could be an area that in this COVID-19 sort of lockdown period, you might wanna to start to learn a little, watch some free YouTube or something, because. Very, very, very few property investors do anything with Facebook advertising. I'm gonna move on to the next one, which is Google advertising. Let's see if anyone's actually using Google advertising, has done, wants to, never used it, whatever. So not surprisingly, it's broadly similar. Sometimes you get a little bit more use of Google than Facebook because people have used it longer. It's been around a little longer uh, when it comes to their advertising model. Other times you get a little bit more Facebook use because it's actually what a lot of people use when it comes to property discussions. Um, but Facebook ads and Google ads are rarely used by property people. Therefore, there's very little competition or there's at least in the presentations I've done, this is very consistent. Either I'm attracting the wrong people or there's very little competition. Let's talk about social media and online sharing where you chat online, you share things. And I'm particularly thinking like property groups and other places where you're likely gonna see other property investors. Almost everybody here tonight probably found out about this through one particular property group. So who tends to use it a lot, who barely uses it? Again, notice how the responses are broken down by the experience levels of the people. 
who are actually voting. So we get to see if there's any patterns emerging between the people with less experience or more experience and whether they used uh, social media or not. I do want to encourage participation. There'll be a little uh, giveaway to a further in the presentation for those that are participating. So let's move on. If you could type in the names, a clear name of the actual group you use or the forum you use or the, or the you know, maybe website when it comes to online discussions, just so people know where other people are looking and what, what might be a good resource. So, you know, not just Facebook, but Facebook property investors group or something like that. Uh, so that, that way people know what else to look at. I think all of you know about the property investors group. That's why you're here. UK property traders, another popular group, slightly different focus there, slightly more on property trading, which is great. All about property is a more general group that I'm part of also, which has been around quite a long time. I think there's 25,000 people there. Property 118, I know Mark from before he founded Property 118. Property Hub is the Rob and Rob folks. HMO property groups, yes. If you're an HMO investor, it probably makes sense to be in an HMO specific group some of the time. Uh, there's also an SA group for those that are in the service accommodation. Uh, there are a couple of development groups. Kevin Wright's uh, page and the Alliance property group. So these are some ideas folks for places you might know about. And then there's some other ideas uh, that maybe you don't know about. Yes, you could use LinkedIn and there's a few groups there. Uh, this audience is probably a little biased towards Facebook given how it was this event was promoted. So contribute what you like there, that's great. And I'm gonna move on and other people can see that when they want to. So let's ask about private funding. How many of you have ever used private funding for a loan? You've done private funding for a JV deal. You've maybe done both, some people do both or you haven't used private funding at all yet. Now, private funding gets talked about a lot, but as you can see, at least from this audience, it's not used that often. Uh, classically also what I see is people who have used it, it's a little bit more on the debt side. It's a simpler structure, it's a simpler model. It doesn't work all that well for some things, but it is maybe where a number of people might start. And then essentially people move to JVs um, when they need to raise what I call equity. So the bit above the loan that the lender will classically provide you if you go to a bank or something. So this is all about if you're gonna raise money, I've, I've seen some earlier questions. It's really your performance, but also do people trust you? So Simon Sayak, Sinek is someone that you might've heard of. You can search for this recording. It's a two and a half minute uh, recording. And he's talking about how he's worked with the US Navy SEALs on performance versus trust. And what he talks about is there's a scale on the side there on the left side, which is all about performance. And then across the bottom is trust levels from low trust to high trust, low performance to high performance. And he basically says, I may trust you with my life. This is a Navy SEAL speaking. When it comes to, I know that the person can perform, but do I trust you with my money or my wife? Okay, they're all guys, sorry, ladies, but the SEALs are guys. So the point here is you might think someone's competent, but do you actually trust them with your money? This is how property investors who have cash think about. Do they trust you? Are you gonna screw it up? Are you gonna, be able to return what you say you're gonna return in terms of results. Now, there's a lot of people who talk a good game, they, they, could, they know all the stuff, they're high performance, but they're low trust. And the irony, as he says here, is it's easy to find those. And if you're in a corporate world, essentially all you have to do is ask who the asshole is, and by the way, that is in the recording, and everybody knows who that person is, where they, they know their stuff, but they're a real jerk. And then there's the other people, which are the go-to people, the people you can depend on. Dan was talking about this earlier, the people that will, when things get bad, they'll still be around, they'll still pay their bills, they'll still do 
what they say they were going to do, or they'll fix the problem. So look for Simon Sinek performance versus trust, that phrase. You'll find it. It's under three minutes. It's well worth watching it. It's a very quick, short thing. And this is how private investors figure out who they're going to work with. Also, by the way, if you go to a live meeting, if, assuming we have them in the future, the people with the most money tend to sit in the back of the room if they're looking for who they might want to invest with. They want to see who's asking questions. They want to see what's going on in the room. They don't raise their hand and say, oh, I've got a ton of money. Could you come talk to me? They tend to be quite quiet and they will approach you. And what they're looking for is, should they trust you? Do you seem like you have the lights on upstairs? So it's no like trust. This is required for doing deals. We also for the UK have to worry about the Financial Conduct Authority regulations. Uh, the, the human side's the same, but each country has its own regulations for financial promotions. So question for the audience, a little interactivity again. By the way, you can watch how this, uh, when you answer, there's be a little animation. So what is your biggest problem? Are you time poor? Do you keep running out of cash because you have more deals? Or do you have enough cash, but you can't find the deals? Or you, are you scared of making a mistake? So nine people so far have answered. We have 56% are worried about running out of cash or keep running out of cash. And 33% can't find enough deals, which implies they have more cash than they have deals. 10%, basically one person is time poor. Many times they make a very good passive investor, particularly if they know what they're doing. Generally, people who are newer, their biggest concern is about making a mistake as if you can avoid all mistakes. i uh, tell you right now that you can't avoid mistakes. It's more how you recover. And this comes back to that trust question again. So with 12 votes, we're pretty much split between one group that has too much money and not enough deals and one group that has too many deals and not enough money. And the reason I highlight this is even in a small group like this, if you could figure out how to talk to each other, there's deals and money in the actual room already. So as I said, many times the solutions in the rule in the room, I spend a bunch of time talking to different groups about financial conduct authority and the regulations, how to raise money legally. And I think it was Martin, this is how you can raise equity. Uh, this is all how you can raise private loans. And generally what happens is the people that have money know what the drill is. They know what the FCA expects. And in a period of 10 days, three different parties or a couple and two parties, two different parties. So three different entities came up to me and said, now that we get that you get it, we have cash. Can you help us? And it adds up to just over 40 million in sterling cash. This is pre-coronavirus. And by the way, that was from Scotland to London to another place. So if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A. It's probably the best place for them rather than here. Now, who has a deal and needs help? Someone have a deal, they need some help with money. Someone has a deal that needs some help when it comes to skills or knowledge or someone that maybe needs both, or don't worry about it, you get it all sorted. So again, this is an example of, in effect, segmenting the room or sort of letting people understand that the answers may be right in the room. There are some people that need some help uh, when it comes to understanding a detail or a skill or whatever. There are other people that need cash and then there's some people that need both and that's fine too. In fact, some of the best JVs would come from both. You just have to worry about the legal uh, structure for the JVs. So let's talk about finding the money and like the movie uh, Jerry Maguire, it's all about show me the money. The FCA requires pre-vetting. You're not allowed to just shoot your mouth off about your great deals to every person, which means you can't post to Facebook about a great deal and expect to legally raise money. You have to pre-vet these people. You have to know who's exempt from the regulations and who isn't. So 
there are a set of tests that you need to run people through before you can actually talk to them about your deal. They either need to be sophisticated investors or high net worth. Here's one of the questions. Are you presently, this is for you all to vote, are you presently a member of a network or syndicate of business angels and you've been so for six plus months? Classically, there'll be a very few people in the room that would pass this one. Uh, there are some people that are part of business angel groups, but most of the time it's quite low. Uh, I suspect with 12 people active that obviously tonight there is no one who fits this one. So this is one of the ways that you can be exempt from some of the FCA regulations as a cash investor, as the passive investor. Next question. More than you've done more than one, you've completed more than one equity investment in an unlisted company in the last two years. Maybe you bought shares in a startup, maybe you bought shares in an SPV, you're a passive investor, you're buying shares in investments, you're not running the investment. You could have bought shares on a crowdfunding site. It does not mean you put money in for a loan, it means you actually bought shares in a company that has a deal on a crowdfunding site. Similar to last time, 12 people voted. Actually, in this case, we have one that would pass the FCA test on this. That means they are a sophisticated investor by this criteria. You only have to pass one criteria. Professional in private equity. So you're in the business of private equity, maybe you were at Edinburgh, Scotland, West End of London, uh, maybe some other places, but you're in the business of providing uh, PE. Notice I've moved the columns around so we can look at the dots on the other side. And by the way, this is have you, you could have done this sometime prior in the last two years. It was your day job. One more. Come on, number 12. If you have questions on any of these, you can definitely add them to the uh, Q&A in the presentation. Uh, sorry, in the uh, Zoom. So provision of finance to SMEs. If you don't understand what an SME is, then you're not in the business of providing finance to SMEs. That means it wouldn't be you. Uh, if you know what SME means and you're used to providing finance to them, then you fit the bill. For those that are overseas, SME is small and medium enterprise. Essentially, you're in the business of business finance for small to medium enterprises. So again, no one passes this test. So, so far we have one person that's passed one of the criteria, if I'm counting right, who is a sophisticated investor in the room, in the virtual room tonight. What if you're a director of a company with a million pounds turnover any time in the last two years? So either director, managing director is fine, uh, director, but if you went to company's house and looked up this person, or maybe if you're in a different country that they are actually a director of a company with turnover a million pounds or higher. So very similar results. Um, again, one person passed. It could be the same person, it might be a different person, but we now know a different way that someone's passed the test. So let's talk about high net worth. You're currently in a salaried position or uh, your annual tax return that you file for your income, your normal income is 100K a year, uh, maybe you work at a bank or something, maybe you run a business that has good turnover and you draw on 100,000 a year. In particular, you, if you are, then you also have to, are you likely to see that next year? So the COVID-19 period, this can be a problem if your salary drops a lot this year. Okay, again, it looks like we have an audience that doesn't have uh, high net worth status for annual income. So let me move on to high net worth for net assets over 250,000 um, prior year, this year, whatever. This could be high for some landlords because some of us have a lot of equity. Uh, it doesn't mean we have cash flow, but it does mean we have the equity and it's not our residence. So this excludes your primary residence, excludes any pension and it excludes any life insurance, but it's fairly common, and especially in some of the meetings I've gone to, in Kent and Glasgow and London, where 
a reasonable number of people have enough of a portfolio that they would be high net worth on just their rental properties. So one might be this year, three uh, claiming that they're high net worth uh, for last year and the rest uh, not eligible under this criteria. So we have just run what the FCA expects you to do with every investor you're talking to before you speak to them. The emphasis is on the before you speak to them about your opportunity. You have to basically do a health check before you start telling them how great a deal you have. So those are the criteria. People only have to pass one, self-certification or independent certification for high net worth, self-certification for a sophisticated investor. It doesn't hurt if you basically, like a mortgage broker would do, get them to let you send a letter to HR to verify their income or verify their employment status or whatever it is that they're claiming is the reason they're exempt. You would actually have to protect the information, the name, the contact details <clears throat> in a way that complies with the information commissioner, the ICO, and this has got to be GDP, GDPR compliance. Uh, the smart money, the people who are exempt know what the tests are. They can tell if you don't know because you're not asking the right questions. You get labeled in their mind as a bozo because you're now going to put their money at risk because you're technically breaking the law just having a conversation with them. So shifting gears, we're going to talk about why do you use debt? Well, the reason is because it's lower cost of capital in most cases. And the reason it's lower cost of capital is because the lender is secured and they have priority if there's a default. The equity investors could get wiped out and yet the lender might get 100% of everything they're owed. So here it is in a different uh, form, but essentially the point is we normally have to use debt with some equity. Equity is the cash above the loan. It's your savings. That's why I wouldn't worry about the 2% or 5%. Even if it's 5% inflation, you're going to find a good deal that's 20% off. You're, you're way ahead. Once you start getting good at uh, finding deals, raising debt is not hard. Talk to Dan's mortgage broker or someone else. The problem is going to be you start running out of the cash, the equity that you need. And if you're going to do option deals, if you're going to do planning deals, these are 100% equity. They're rarely ever financeable as debt. So you need to learn how to raise equity. So I would say, don't waste your time learning how to raise debt. Learn how to raise equity and everything will start to make sense. This is a visual to make it clear. Uh, if you were just a simple buy to let investor, the red is the loan, the green is the equity that you have to put in. Some people say the deposit. Uh, I'm talking about more than just the deposit. It might be the repair money. If you're a developer, you actually could have layers of debt, senior debt, stretch senior, mezzanine debt. You might have equity for more than one group or more than one party. So that's the visual. These are the tranches, as it says, the LTVs or the slice or the width of the tranche. Loan to value only makes sense for debt because it's a loan. That's the L. So the equity, you wouldn't say loan to value when you talk about equity. It could be 100% equity or it could be zero equity. Return on investment, you have on the other side, which is the types of rates of return that people might expect if they're actually looking at the funding a deal, being part of a deal. When they're in the first position, secured, 50% LTV, 4% might be fine. But if they're all the way up on the top of the stack, willing to get wiped out, but looking for that sizzle, they want maybe 50% return on their money. This is where you could get into trouble, though, if you over leverage using too much debt. So FCA, Financial Conduct Authority, they regulate actions related to the four things above, promoting, arranging, pooling, or advising on investments. They do not regulate real estate, the ownership, of real estate, the buying and selling of real estate. What they do regulate is if you're trying to raise money, if you're posting in Facebook about having a great deal and talk to me about a JV, that would be possibly a criminal act. Even the communication can be a violation that can get you arrested. It's highly unlikely it'll happen just for a minor offense, but the point is it is a criminal act. It's not just a civil matter where you pay a small fine. So, there's Angus Griffin, there's the name at the bottom. He is a property investor, but in particular, he spent 15 years already as a lawyer. 10 of those years were working at the FCA in enforcement. So he's the guy that ran the pit bulls and he would send them out to attack people who are breaking the rules earlier. 
And whether that's British Steel or something else, it went from big companies to small to individuals and including some property people. The other thing is he also wrote the handbook on how to do prosecutions or how to do investigations. Uh, so he and I hooked up to create a course. We did this course late last year, and that course was all about essentially how to raise funding legally. We did this live course as a way to get feedback from the room. That's actually where part of that 40 million came from is someone in the room came to us later, said, you guys understand, can you help me actually place the money? Because it's like, now I get what the rules are that uh, I need to be checking everybody for. So we created this A4 flowchart. You can get a copy of it if you want. We also then turned the live class into an online course. And the reason I'm telling you that is you might be able to win that tonight. So this is what it looks like online. That's just a shot from the frame, one of the frames, but the, the topics are there listed on the right. And you can see real quick what some of the topics are that we cover. It takes about four and a half hours as the online class, so I have literally with no gaps, took all day in a live class. So there's a flow chart. If you want a copy, that's the URL. You can get a copy for free. If you want to take the course and pay for the course, 197 pounds. And tonight you can actually win the course. So we're going to do a quiz to see who is actually going to be the winner. You need to again interact with this uh, menti.com, same as before. And the quiz has the following criteria. So I need you to just read, think about what you're reading, and then make a choice. It's a very simple choice. I'm basically asking you is what you've just read legal or not? All of these are things that were posted online. I didn't make this stuff up, people were posting it. There's a prize, as I said, for a person who wins. And if there's more than one winner, fine. Use your first name. It's going to ask you when the quiz starts what the name or ID or whatever. Just use your first name, the same one you used earlier. So are we ready? Actually, one question, a little deviation. Have you actually taken this quiz before? There may be some people here that have seen this before. I've changed it up a bit, but I'm just trying to find out if anyone's seen it before. I'd like to make sure that the winner is someone that's new to the quiz, so I think it's more uh, appropriate. Uh, therefore, Dan won't be... Uh, the winner tonight. You saw this a week ago. Cool. So again, ready, set, go. Here we go. So set up your name and then look at this screen. It should show up on your device and on the screen. This was, as I said, on Facebook or LinkedIn or um, Instagram or Twitter or something. The red is where I took out some stuff so that we would protect the innocent and maybe the guilty. So I'm gonna to go to the next screen, assuming everybody's read this, you have to decide is this legal or not. So you've picked your names. All correct answers get maximum points. So there's 12 seconds for you to pick your answer. Seven of you I think have picked already. Eight, nine, 10, three seconds, two, one, time's up. So the people who participated Six have this right. It is actually illegal. That was a criminal act, in my opinion, for that to be posted. So they committed a crime that could cause them to get arrested. So here's the leaderboard. See how people are doing. There are the people that picked correctly, and then there are the other three at the bottom who didn't get this one right. This will move around quite a bit. Some of the questions uh, really do trip up some people, and other questions are quite obvious. So here's one. Uh, hello, I'm an investor looking specifically at service accommodation, clearly posted before COVID-19. Uh, they're looking for operators who require some initial capital. They want to be a 49% uh, shareholder and they want a cut of the profit. They're looking for opportunities where the operator can show some track record. Happy to chat. Moving forward. So what do people think of this one? 
was the Facebook post a legal financial promotion or was it illegal financial promotion? So it was legal. Three of you didn't get it right, that's fine. Um, the reason it was legal is the person with the cash, the passive investor is allowed to promote and, pro and share things that the person looking for the cash cannot actually say. So the point here is you can, the law is to protect the people with the cash, not to protect the people who need the cash. Fairness matters, but fundamentally, I can say things as someone with cash that you can't ask for. So here's how the score breaks down. We've had some people recover and some other people drop back. So we have four people in the lead. A group of you can possibly catch up. We have enough questions to do that easily. So here's another one. This was in the UK property traders. Um, we are looking for a 31K investment on 10 brand new SA apartments in Liverpool. So forget the SA part, don't worry about that. It's not an issue for the FCA. This is near the airport, all money out plus ROI, who's in? This will go quickly. So now that I've read it all to you, there's not much more that you need to read. So what do you think? Legal, illegal? Eight of you have voted. Three, two, one, time's up, nine votes, cool. So illegal or illegal, it's illegal. So three had it wrong, six had it right. Basically there was a scarcity being used in that. So if you understand internet marketing and if you rush to the back of the room right now, you, the first 10 will get a special deal or anything like that, or it's gonna go quick, that's illegal for the financial promotions to the retail public. So Rebecca got that one and she'll move up a bit. So yeah, we're seeing some stratification, two people contending for the lead. Let's see if someone else can close the gap. Here's another one, vacant commercial premises, identified with well-established tenant waiting to occupy and sign a lease. Funds are required 150,000 and a purchase price 180, so it's not terribly big transaction. The funds will be needed for 12 months, eight to 10% interest is offered, and they're happily giving a first charge if that's what you like. PM for full details and an initial chat. By the way, hosts of groups hate it when you say PM me. If you can't discuss it in the group, it'll probably get taken down. So what do people think of this one? Five seconds, all nine have voted. Time's up. So this one's illegal, particularly because they talked about a quality, high quality tenant who's willing to sign. They're promoting something that doesn't exist. They have a suspect, they have a lead, but they don't have a tenant. It's a vacant premises. So they're trying to make it look more attractive than maybe it is. It was borderline, but there's definitely a problem with it. So we have a clear leader right now. Let's see if someone can catch up. There's four of you who are in second that are close. JV partner wanted. This person and their business partner have a number of flips and small developments in the pipeline. So there's multiple deals. Team has experience in construction in the property industry. If you'd like further details in their obligation chat, please feel free to get in touch with themselves or and I clearly have hidden who these people are. All projects, by the way, are in the Southeast and they list some locations. Again, I took that out. So 
So what do you think of that one? Five seconds. All nine have voted. So seven of you think it's legal. The key to this one is the person is not promoting any deals. They're just talking about their business and their what they do. There's no actual financial offer. So that made it legal. Let's see how this how this stacks up. Ooh, now we have a rush to the front again. Next question. I'm raising an increments of 10K to invest in a mix of rent to rent service accommodation. That's what R2SA stands for in rent to HMO. So R2 HMO. So essentially they want 10K investments to create a mix of properties. Um, they're going to sublet them as service accommodation. Again, forget the virus thing or they're gonna rent the whole house and maybe do room rents. Five people put in 10K to acquire six units and they split the profit by five. They're not buying the properties, that's why the numbers are smaller. Uh, greatly reduces the risk of individual units. Estimated return is provided, our ROI per year for three years is what they think, and that they're saying it's fully compliant. So given I read it all, I'm gonna jump right to the voting. Three, two, one. Ooh, we didn't get the last person to vote. Oh, well. One person thought it was legal. Seven thought it was illegal. It is definitely illegal. There is so many ways that that was illegal. That, were, that one was way off the mark. So let's see what the leaderboard looks like now. Okay, we have a winner. Ash is the winner. And we had a close second by 10 points. Well done, Ash. You have won access to the course full as if you paid for it. I just need an email address. Um, you can get it to Dan, you can message me. Um, don't put it in the Q&A. We don't want necessarily your email address for everybody to see, but you can find me all over the, the net. So again, the FCA regulates four things that relate to property. And we were just focusing on promoting and you saw now a number of examples of live posts that people have made that were illegal. Um, essentially a financial promotion is an inducement to engage. So move now, this will go fast. Those are inducements. It's very circumstance specific with no clear lines. The key is active encouragement to take action on an investment. Uh, what you can not do is just go and tell everyone about your deal, how great it is and why it's better than a bank or definitely do not talk about better than bank interest rates. They hate that at the FCA. So don't say anything that induces them to invest all the stuff that you might learn through direct sales or marketing um, and do not guarantee a thing. Um, any and all promotions need to be authorized by an FCA authorized person or firm. The FCA has its own specialized FinProm team. If you want to uh, actually uh, understand that they do have a team of people dedicated to looking for this, because of the way the risk tolerance work, they're not going to probably bother you until they get a complaint. And the classic way you're going to get a complaint is when an investor who's put money in doesn't like what you've done and they're unhappy that you're late, that you didn't pay them what you said, that project didn't work out well, that COVID-19 happened and they want their money back. And instead of hiring a lawyer, they can ring the FCA and say, look, here's the person, this is what they did. And if the FCA takes an interest in it, all of a sudden the pit bulls will come tear you apart and tie you up for six months. You have to supply all kinds of information to them in the formats that they want. This is all according to Angus. And suddenly, even if your business was legit, you're stuck trying to answer all these questions. The biggest problem is you have unlimited liability to your investors. So forget the two years at Her Majesty's HMO. What you can do is network. And this is in the flow chart. It's a little part of the flow chart. 
You can talk to people about your company. You can talk to people about your past deals, what I call case studies. You can educate people about how things work. You can share your expertise. If you're gonna then capture the details about a, being a possible suspect lead for the future, and that maybe you would wanna qualify them, you need to worry about data protection. So you can offer some basic literature, general broad sweeping things, but not a deal that you're actually looking for money for. If they're starting to make noises like, hey, this is getting serious and everybody knows what that means, then you need to stop them. There's no exemption for family and friends once you've already started your property journey. You basically have to figure out, like we did earlier, are they certified or self-certified high net worth? Are they a sophisticated investor? You need to document it, you need to keep records, full audit trail, timestamps of when you talk to them, when you verified them versus when you showed them a deal. Some people talk about SaaS as uh, this is a pension opportunity for those that are outside the UK as if it's some sort of workaround. This is not the workaround for the FCA regulations. This could get you into the same trouble. And by the way, if you try to put more than two investors, so technically more than one investor, so two or more into the same deal as passive investors, that is a collective investment scheme. Even if they're all high net worth or sophisticated, you do not have the ability to do that unless you are authorized to run a collective investment scheme. So remember what I was saying earlier, focus on what you can control. It's all about cash flow and cash reserves. Don't chase the uh, ROI. Build relationships and access to capital. We just saw ways to build relationships and what not to do. And don't even try to do this market timing stuff. That's just a waste of time. Focus on upskilling. Invest in yourself right now if you can't find deals that make sense. And if you need to get in touch, this is how you can get in touch. Uh, Ash, if you want, you can book a call. We can chat about it. Uh, or you can just find me this way. There's all those details. Send me a message and I can get you access to the course. And that's it, Dan, for the actual presentation. Thanks, John. Has uh, ever a really techy and uh, a really good interactive session. So we had a couple of people jump off saying thanks for the session, really enjoyed it. So um, Kath and uh, Victoria had to bail out, but uh, left some kind comments, which is great. Okay, well, um, thanks, JC. So I th that takes us into the Q&A part of the event. So we do have one which was posted by Isaac a little while ago. So just while I'm reading that out and answering it, or John, if you want to answer it, if anyone else has got any questions, feel free just to put them on the Q&A chat there for everyone to see, and we'll, we'll try and answer them as best as we can. And they can be questions about what John's talked about, the raising the funds legally. It could be about the current set of circumstances. But you know what? We're here. We're on the event. We've got a few more minutes left. Any question about property, we'll do our best to, to answer it. So, Isaac, so one one before the question so one thing you can do folks if you want to raise money legally in the uk you can actually use um crowdfunding and i don't mean peer-to-peer -peer lending i mean crowdfunding to raise equity dan's done this a few times for some planning deals and literally you can raise the cash that you need to complement the cash the lenders providing you would raise it in the form of shares in an spv it would be an equity raise by going the crowdfunding route you would actually have permission to run a collective scheme the investors do not have to be high net worth. They can be whatever they are. And the platform worries about all of the, the AML, the KYC, all the, the housekeeping things, data protection. That's the platform's problem. And it's a very cost-effective way to do it. Yeah, thanks, John. And crowdfunding is a great way of getting yourself and your deals out there in the public eye without breaching any GDPR or any... NDA or anything like that. So it's a great way to show everyone your deals in real life. So there's no there's no gray area. There's no well that you you're telling us this, but what's this? Everything is there in plain sight to see. And equally, it's plain sight to see who raises uh, money with you. And it's even more plain sight when you pay someone back. So uh, a, a, a big big fan of crowdfunding. And John and I have worked on a couple together. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go with Isaac's question. Um, thanks for the question, Isaac. Is it possible to work, sorry, if it's possible to work from home in the future uh, and they don't need to pay high rents and there's no need to li live close to city centres? You could pay a lower rent and perhaps live in the countryside 
as they can take advantage of the work from home flexibility? Could this impact uh, the rental market and the PRS? Um, so I saw that question when you posted it a, a little while ago, Isaac, and, um, and I think it's a really good question and it's a fair one. But I was thinking about the terminology when um, people were using horses as transportation and they were trying to get horses more exercises and feeding them the right way because they wanted to move faster from towns and villages. But what they didn't need was faster horses. They needed a better form of transportation. And when cars came out uh, and, and came into the masses and removed things like horses from transportation, it doesn't mean that horses died off and were never used again. There was just a different use for horses and the value of individual horses maybe rose and they were just used for different things. Now, I'm not saying that um, when the office buildings are no longer used and people are then living in the countryside, the, go the, the, the cities are going to be used for something completely different. The, the terminology that I'm trying to refer to is that if anything has taught us, and I, I haven't been involved in property for decades, I'm 35, I'm like 15 years in, but what I have learned is if you're not forever shifting and flexing and moving with the market and legislations and seeing for the new, the new opportunities or creating different markets within markets, then you're not going to be as successful. And I think it's a fair point, but that's just where the opportunities are coming. And as one thing changes and shifts, other opportunities open. And I don't know what they are. I don't know what's going to be the volume of new offices that land. I don't know if people are going to move to the countryside, which means that um, some of the fields that are outside the development boundary may then fall into the development boundary because they're open and there's more opportunity to build. There's going to be opportunities out, out there. So uh, hopefully that gives you some comfort on, on that point. So, okay. So, so I have a comment on that, uh, maybe a slightly different point of view even. So there are some things that, um, some sectors that we can look to. So the movie industry, the finance industry, and the technology industry. And what you'll find is all three of those are very early adopters when it comes to moving information around. They, uh, they don't really require people to live at a certain place from a weather point of view or anything else. And yet you see these clusters, Hollywood, Bollywood, uh, finance centers, New York, London, uh, tech center, Silicon Valley, there's no reason most of those people have to be in Silicon Valley, yet classically many of them are. So you would, I think, find that while a number of people might want to move out and live somewhere else, quite a few people want to be where everybody else is in their field. So there'll be this sort of funny mixing and matching and until the virtual experience is really immersive. And I feel like I'm in the same office with Dan and I turn and he's right there, the hologram or something then I think there'll still be times when you really do want to be with everybody else that's doing what you're doing rather than you're in your shed somewhere and no one else is visible except on the screen. In the COVID-19 period though, we can test this. So let's find out, let's see what works, what doesn't work, what, you know, whether people sort of go stir crazy and they actually want to go meet people for a coffee or something. Thanks, John. Okay, next question is from Ash. So uh, congrats, Ash, on winning the competition. Could I raise funds for a deposit by crowdfunding, then use the deposit for a bridge and loan? John, do you want to answer that one? Yes. That's the answer. <laughs> so the, the other way to hear that is you need to focus on what the lender allows. A lot of bridges are perfectly fine with crowdfunding. It's cash as far as they're concerned, because it really is and they're perfectly happy with having cash above their loan. And the fact that it didn't directly come from you doesn't necessarily bother them. They may still wanna see some cash from you so that you have some incentive to finish the project, but some of the bridges like, I don't really care. I'm just gonna rip, their, rip his face off and take his property. So why do I care if it's someone else's money that I just benefit from? I like the analogy there, cool. Okay, we'll answer that. Uh, next question is from Anita. Can anyone participate in online auctions? Do I need to pay a fee up front? Um, okay, so it depends on the auction company. There's three slash four main ones in Norwich. Auction House is one of them and they're a franchise. So there's lots of them around the UK. They are open to the underwriting. You can go and bid online 
you don't need to pay a fee but you do need to pre-register and that's not just for online auctions that's also auctions in the room um, and they tend to give you a little panel with a number on it there are other auctions there that um, you can just turn up to in the room and start waving your hand and they'll take your bid but as soon as that hammer falls down they'll come and hunt you down so don't start turning up to rooms just waving your hands around but for online auctions yeah you can um, register they tend to all use a similar format to um, access the online auction and the legal pack so when you're reviewing the legal pack before you bid in it will tend to be the same login details and the same uh, screen so you don't have to create like two accounts and I think what's really good about the online auctions which I was impressed with is you don't need to cl keep clicking refresh the technology is caught up so it just updates in real time and you could see the bid in but they do tend to play the old game that as it's counting down three two one you'll see an extension of the time for another minute so don't think that just because you're a few seconds in when you click bid and you're going to necessarily win they can keep extending the final time which is one of those ebay old tricks so i hope that answers your question anita john i don't know if you want to add to that uh, i don't have auction experience that matters here so okay cool um we've got another question here uh, fabrizio hopefully i've pronounced that correctly crack a name thank you for the information about the crowdfunding to do things legally is always very important we agree how does the crowdfunding platform work if the project is in considerable is considered suitable sorry there is a fee to pay on the funds raised or how do we pay for the service so i'll let john answer this one in full but from my experience you raise funds on the platform and you pay just like a lender a percentage of those uh, funds to the platform so like if you're borrowing money from a bridging lender like it's a hundred thousand they may charge you like a one percent arrangement fee or a two percent arrangement fee it's very similar to the crowdfunding platform but i'll let john answer that in a bit more detail that was a good start dan so yeah the essentially platforms um assume that there's some sort of listing fee the cost to actually put your deal on the platform it could be two, 500, you know, 200 pounds to 500 pounds. So let's say it's 500 pounds to get it listed. And that is your fee for them to spend time reviewing your documents, take it through compliance, go back and forth with you on any of the issues they need corrected. They'll also vet every single piece of communication that you're gonna send out because they need to be on top of what you're saying about the offer. If you are successful, if you raise the target amount that you wanna raise, either the minimum or the max, but somewhere between those two, then they will charge you approximately 5%, uh, some minor room to negotiate maybe, but 5% is what you should price in. And you could actually raise 5% more than you need. They will net that off and send you the balance. Um, so you can decide whether you wanna pay a return on the money that you are paying, you know, the 5%, if you raise it through your raise, then you're gonna to have to pay a rate of return on that too. But essentially it's a, a success fee. If you can't hit the number you wanted to hit as a minimum, then there's nothing after that 500 uh, to start off. Cool, thanks, John. That hey, I wanted to questions. Yeah. mention something else because we don't have any questions right now, but, um, this is an HMO thing, and Dan, maybe you can have a perspective on it. So let's assume you have an HMO with professional sharers, so it's not a student um, group, and maybe one of them's a doctor, one of them's a nurse, one of them's a lawyer, whatever they are, but either they work in a high-risk role, so nursing in one of the Nightingale hospitals, or they actually show signs of COVID-19, so now they're self-isolating in the HMO. I think what I've heard, and I don't have HMOs, at least not at this time, uh, what I've heard from some is that suddenly all the other residents get a little nervous. All the other residents either clear out or the whole place starts to go into lockdown. Um, so any thoughts uh, about how HMOs might be a special risk in this time? So if anyone has got a, an opinion or a question on that, um, do, do start typing it, but I'll give my two pennies. So 
I guess it's, it's, it's a very difficult set of circumstances and students aren't necessarily too dissimilar because even though you might have a group of students who have joined and taken a tendency as a collective group, you're still dealing with four, five, six individuals who come from different families. And in my experience, I actually don't have, I don't think so, no, I don't think I have any professional HMOs at the moment. But my experience is that with students, they are deemed to be, say, in a, in a position where they don't want to start self-isolating in their student house. So a lot of my guys have gone and fled and gone back to home with their parents, but they're still liable and they still are paying their rent. And I don't think it's anything dissimilar to a professional HMO. You have to respect people's opinion and desire to take themselves out of certain, certain circumstances, more so if there is a nurse in bedroom A and they're in bedroom B, um, but there's still a liability there. Now, I get it that there is going to be some conversations where they're saying, I don't feel comfortable or content to stay and share this house, this kitchen, because this person is in a more high-risk uh, job. And I think, you know, that, that is a really fair point. And I think as a landlord, you need to take a view on doing the right thing. Um, and I said this earlier on with the rent to rent guys. And, you know, everyone's sets of circumstances are different. So you can't, you can't take this as a blanket view because if you've got five HMOs and there's five tenants in each of them, and each one of them have got one nurse in, and so the other four tenants want to jump ship, you're going to kill your revenue. But you, you've got to be doing the right thing. And, and I think if you've got a tenant who wants to take himself out of that property, or you've got multiple tenants that want to take themselves out of that property because of one tenant, you either maybe say, yes, you can go, or it might be better to find alternative accommodation for the nurse or, or the doctor. Yes. Yeah. I, I don't know what the yeah. other and is. I think, yeah. I think that's a good point, Dan. And I, and I like, the ethics that you're taking from, and just so people know, if I was uh, on a normal AST, single let, HMO, whatever, the actual tenant is allowed to break the contract early, and they're only liable for the amount of time it, uh, or the loss to the landlord when it's vacant. So the landlord is under an obligation to refill it, and if they can't get it refilled, then fine, maybe the tenant's liable for the full amount, but the burden's actually on the landlord to mitigate their loss. So then you have the issue of, so if you have all on suites and you drop refrigerators into them, suddenly people can self-isolate. They're not doing so much sharing, maybe the washing machine or something. If you have a lot of shared facilities and nothing on suite, then everybody's sort of mixing it up all the time. Maybe they're working, maybe they're not. There's a, in the daily uh, podcast that I shared, they're talking about possibly two years before they can really nail down a vaccine. And we're not getting very many people actually infected. So if we come out of this lockdown in three weeks, we're only looking at five to 10% of the population has actually had it. So let's pretend that they're somehow immune because they have antibodies. Well, the other 90, 95% of the population is now susceptible to getting it. So if I was an investor looking at more HMOs, you may struggle going forward because lenders might start to switch their criteria or you're going to have a lot more voids. You know, it's a little bit of an unknown when it comes to close quarters, shared accommodation, just like the U.S. Navy aircraft carrier. That was a big problem. And they now think the virus ended up on the aircraft carrier because of one of the shuttle flights bringing food to the carrier. Yeah, it's an interesting point about what is going to be the new normal. Uh, and I saw an image, I think it was earlier on today, about the new economy seating. Instead of having three stacked in a row, you've got two faced in one way and the middle one guy facing the other with some shield on either side. So it's just, it's just about thinking out of the box. We may, I'm not, I'm not saying build shields in your HMO kitchens or anything. Don't try and do too much too soon. We need to let the dust settle and see how the new world is evolved and adapt to that, not preemptively adapt and overkill something. Um, okay, well, I don't think we've had any more questions there. John, has anyone got any? Oh, I we think we're all good. Jump off? Yeah, so. Okay, yeah. well, um, I know you've got another meeting to go to, John. So if there is no more questions, we'll bring it to a close. And I'll say a huge thank you for everyone who is still on to us uh, with us to the end. 
If you have got any questions, then do feel free to message me or John privately or uh, text us or, or whatever. Our question has just popped up. Yeah, and you can find yeah. us in the Facebook group that you know we're in. So, Absolutely. And uh, Ash has just put on there a big thanks. So we'll bring it to an end. Huge thank you. We're contactable. So just feel free to message us. But if not, uh, stay safe, everyone. And I'll catch you all. We'll catch you all very soon. Thank you. See ya.